Okay, my name is Lynn Heaton, uh, Chief Financial Officer for the Department. We're going to cover changes to the financial provisions uh, since the last pre-bid meeting. Uh, we've continued our conversations with the U.S. Department of Transportation, uh, Build America Bureau, regarding the TIPIA option. Uh, we've also received some questions and provided responses to a number of those questions um, from you. Um, and so, a number, number of different things. We've continued our internal conversations as well. So, uh, we were just, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Barney of Nossman, and we'll, uh, he'll cover uh, change to the financial provisions um, since the last pre bid meeting. Thank you, Lou. Uh, the first thing I want to say is I, I think you can, you can gather from the spirit of what we're trying to do here that. The department is uh, is not trying to limit any commercially feasible solution to finance this project, anything that's not paid from current day. And you, you can understand the challenge of trying to do that because you know the minds of the bankers and the financial advisors, everybody else, they can come up with all kinds of different structures. So you know, as we've gone through the iteration of the special finance provision, the latest addendum, um, we, we've tried to um, signal to you that we're open to any, as I said, commercially feasible way to solving this financial issue. Um, and that includes TIPIA. Um, we've offered a form of term sheet. Um, there's still some things to be finalized in that term sheet, as you can see in some of the bracketed language. Um, it's very important, if you have any questions about the term sheet, that you get, us, get those to us front and center because those need to go through the process as the, um, the TIPIA representative indicated last month. They need to go through a whole bank process with their credit review team. So very important if you're going to finalize the term sheet, you want to use TIPIA, we hear from you if you have any big picture problems with the term sheet the way it's currently drafted. By the way, as indicated, the special finance provision is not a change. If you want to use TIPIA, and you include TIPI as a solution in your financial model, in your financial plan, you're basically saying, I'm agreeing that I will be bound by these terms. Now, that doesn't mean you can't go off to Washington after you're the apparent low or you sign the contract and start the process of renegotiating the term sheet if that's what you want to do. Of course, you have an obligation to get to financial close by March 31, 2020. So there's only so much time that you're going to have for that give and take back there in DC. You know, over this term sheet, which is back to my point before, very important to get up front as many of your concerns at least vetted with um, the TIFIA negotiators as possible. Um, the other thing you may have seen, uh, it, again, with this theme of uh, we're not trying to limit your financial solution, you may have more than one. You may want to couple a bond deal with a bank deal or TIFIA with a bank deal. And TIFIA, of course, is capped. Now, that's one of the changes we learned is TIFIA is capped at 33% of eligible costs. So it may be that you're going to need to come up with another type of facility or borrowing approach to match with TIFIA or any other type of you know, solution that you want to come up with. I mean, the goal here is, of course, you want to, op as they say in the financial world, optimize your solution to produce the lowest cost because you want to win the job. And financing cost is a cost. Uh, is a bid item in the contract in, in, in terms of your submission. So, um, and, and to help with that, we've come up with this way of issuing these these DC DC things, these deferred contract payment certificates, separately to each lender. That way, we don't have lien priority issues or ref flow of funds in a waterfall or any of that kind of stuff. Each lender will get their own DC DC. They can set their maturity date, they can set the amount. And again, the goal is to provide as much flexibility as we can um, in, in offering to you the ability to come up with your financial solutions. So some of the changes to the financial provisions you may have seen in the addendum, including a change you didn't see in the addendum and you're seeing today. Originally, you had to keep your proposals good for 60 days. And the idea there is if we can't get to contract with number one, we want to go to number two. So we want number two's bid to be good for 60 days. We're confident, based on the way that we've set this thing up, and uh, with, of course, all the good um, financial submissions and contract prices y'all are going to come up with, we should be able to get to con under contract within 30 days. So we've reduced the bid proposal period 
from 60 to 30. So you don't need to keep your bids outstanding for that extra 30 days. The other question, remember, that came up, and Marty and I were going back and forth on this, and we wanted to clarify this in the, in the addendum. Um, your bid proposal is not at risk if we, de we determine in our good faith discretion that you do not have a commercially feasible approach to getting the financial close. Um, you get your bid bond back. Thank you. By the way, to help solve that timing problem, though, now we're going to have you submit all the financial stuff along with your bid price. <coughs> Remember, we were going to wait three days, I think Jim Knott mentioned. Now, you, you got it all done anyway. Get it to us sooner, then we can go through the feasibility analysis and decide if we've got someone that we want to get under contract with that we think they can get the financial close by that March date, or this thing just is not, this dog is not hunting. We can't see how you're going to get there. You threw something together, you came up with a price, but frankly, you know, the ratings aren't there, the, the, the due diligence isn't there from the lender, or you come up with some, you know, odd structure that nobody's ever seen before. We're going to tell that to you right away. We're going to, we're going to get the SWAT team out here as soon as those bids are received on the 12th, financial submission materials come in. We're going to come in, take two or three days, go through all that stuff, and immediately decide, yeah, you passed the bar. This is a commercially feasible approach to financing the project. Um, the other TIFIA issue that came up, and this is one that relates to this 33% cap. By the way, it's 33, not 49, that we got clarified. The other issue that came up is, well, how do I build up to those eligible project costs, you as a contractor? You know what your con contract costs, construction costs are going to be and you're familiar with federal rules regarding eligibility, fine. But TIFIA allows to be included in that 33% cap on eligible project costs, project costs incurred by the department. You don't know what the department's incurred or estimated to incur. So we're gonna come up with a number, uh, Lynn, I think we're at 60, 65 million. Uh, we're gonna refine that number in, in the next event. And then to give you an idea, once you decide you wanna use TIFIA, TIFIA will require you to apply. TIFIA will require you to pay their lawyers. TIFIA will require you to pay their financial advisors. So the question, well, how do I know how much that is? Is that millions and millions of dollars? I'm going to send to D.C. to have these guys crawl all over my financial plan and then finally get to close. No, we have an estimate. It looks like a good estimate to us based on our experience working in the TIFIA program. You're looking at about 300 grand on TIFIA costs to get to close. Another issue that came up, and this was really more of a technical question, I think we've solved the problem is, you know, the way we're doing these current pays and the way we're doing these DC pay, DCPCs is on the basis of estimated work. Well, to get to financial close, as many of you are discovering, you're going to have to get some people paid, either an underwriter or a bank, or, you know, always got to get the lawyers paid, right? Um, but seriously, how are you going to get those costs, those financial close costs paid because it's not work within the meaning of an estimated quantity, et cetera. So we've clarified that, um, and Jim Knott came up with a creative idea of including that in your pre mo costs. So you'll be able to submit an invoice, or you, you'll be able to submit a request for those costs, even though you haven't actually started work, because we know you're going to be incurring those, and you want to get reimbursed, or you want to get these people paid. The last item is to make it clear, we, we thought it was clear enough, that NDOT will include in its budgets, will covenant to include in its budgets when it goes to the state legislature and requests appropriation for its work, work program, including this project, <coughs> that the, 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 the seven and a half million dollar payments, right, that's the quarterly cap on how much you're going to get, whether it's at Colo, you know, during the construction period or after, that those amounts will always be included as when, they, when the NDOT builds up its budget, you know, to build up its work plan and to figure out how much money it needs to pay. We've also prioritized those payments. I think you've seen that in the special provisions. So NDOT uh, is agreeing from a commercial standpoint to covenant to budget, to provide the, the budget, to covenant to seek the appropriations and to covenant to prioritize these payments. We're really trying to make these payments as golden as we can, because why? That brings the borrowing costs down, that enhances the credit, and that's good for everybody, particularly the department, because the department's gotta pay the finance back, and to you, because then you can 
optimize uh, your financial solution. So a little bit more on the changes, just to highlight these changes. Uh, we had a 30-day float on payment, a mature period, if you will, on the DCPCs. Uh, the current pay, we changed that to seven business days. We think we can get the money out to you that soon. Um, the other issue that came up, and this might be a little bit in the weeds for a lot of people, but for the people that have spent some time, I think, looking at, as I said before, some of these different financial solutions, well, there's a world out there that says, okay, I love the DCPCs, but I expect that you're going to pay me when you said you were going to pay me on that maturity date, if you will, of that DCPC. And I'm structuring my interest, I'm structuring how I get paid, based on getting paid on that date. Don't pay me early. Because if you pay me early, I might have to pay something called breakage costs. And breakage costs are premiums or penalties or accrued interests or defeats and escrows or all these things. I don't want to get into the details about them, but we heard loud and clear there was a concern that if end up wants to prepay these things, maybe money comes from DC or we, we find a way to get out of this thing and prepay you early, that the lenders need to know that they're going to get paid whatever these breakage costs are to them to get into the deal and give you the best financial solutions. So that, I think, is a major change in terms of the, the DOC, DOT said, we want to keep this option. Well, you're going to have to pay something for it for some of the solutions. TIFIA doesn't have that. That's an advantage for us, anyway, in terms of TIFIA, and maybe even for you in terms of negotiating what these prepayment amounts would be. I want to emphasize your new definition is intended to cover any financial solution, any any related breakage cost, whether it's bank debt or bond financing or whatever. So there's a new definition out there that is supposed to be comprehensive. Again, remember I said we're trying to, we're trying to tailor this thing to match what whatever the, the, the minds can come up with that we are familiar with in our experience. And uh, you know, if we miss something, let us know. But as Brian said, the intent was to cover off all of these so-called breakage costs that occur because end up wants to pay the thing earlier. There's been, I think, a little uh, experiment drag about this deferred contract payment thing for cost overruns. And um, th the idea here is end up wants to reserve the right to not have to pay current pay when we come to a cost overrun. Not your fault. Our, you know, it's on our dime, it's one of our risks, and therefore it's change order time. How is that going to get paid? And we came up with rough justice in terms of the interest cost, 3%. Keep it simple. It may not be the right number, it may be the right number, maybe we should look to something else, fine. If you guys want to come up with some other type of solution, we, that the department needs to reserve the right to defer payment simply because of its budgetary situation. One thing we did try to make clear is this 3% deferred contract payment for cost over, by the way, you know, NDOT's looking to pay cash. Why incur the 3%? So as much as we have the money, we don't pay you current on cost over, uh, on change orders. Um, that said, we have this 3% deferred payment thing when it comes to change orders. We're looking at that as it could be separate and apart from whatever your commitments are from your lenders, so then you don't have to go hat in hand and ask them to incur additional debt because the department wants to reserve this right. Maybe, you know, you can come up with some other facility if this happens. Who knows? In any case, when we negotiate the change order with you, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about this in terms of what your options are to, in effect, finance these change orders, whether it's your existing commitments, maybe you can get additional commitments for additional debt, or you're going to need to find some other bank solution or internal financing solution. We're going to pay 3%. That's staying in for now. So we talked about the optional prepayment with the discounted. Oh, um, it, again, it's, I don't want to get into the details of the TIPI alone, but um, it, in any case, what we've tried to do is come up with a solution to match whatever type of financing uh, structure you come up with. TIFIA just happens to be the, one of the simplest, you know, the simplest ways to do that. So we've highlighted it here. And then finally, as I said, the financial submission is now going to be submitted along with, the, uh, with, with your, your bid price. And look, you're going to have to do all this work anyway. 
So it gets us an earlier start, gets us an earlier decision-making process on whether we want to keep moving on with this person to get to a contract or whether we go to number two. Do you want me to do that one too? Yeah, if you could. Okay. Um, Jim Nott had a great idea, which is, you know, Barney, this is all kind of maybe kind of new to some people, and there's like 40 odd pages of stuff here. Give them a checklist. Tell them what it is that they need to submit as part of their financial submission. So this is just a handy little tool. You can see I put a chart in there. You know, so you can check the box, we can check the box, and at least know that when you submit your financial package, we've got everything that we need to then make the determination as to the so we, we just included a, a list of the things. I know it looks like a lot of stuff, but you're going to need, your, if, if you don't do internal financing, which is an option, by the way, you know, if you've got you know, 150 million lying around somewhere and you want to come up with a rate, put it into a financial plan, we're more than happy to take a look at that. Um, but for most third-party lenders, you're going to need to get all of this information to make them happy in order to get the commitments. This is committed finance. And this is not, yeah, I think I can get that loan. This is, no, I can get that loan. Or I've been to that conduit bond issuer and they're prepared to sell my bonds for me. Or I've, got, I've seen the Tiffany term sheet and that looks great to me. Um, so again, the, the purpose of, the, of this checklist is to give you kind of a shorthand list of things that you're gonna have to come up with, particularly in the third, I call it third party lender or third party, where you're not internally financing uh, the project. Um, you know, financial model, uh, we've, we've taken some of the stuff out. We've tried to make the financial model process, putting the financial model together a little easier because, frankly, you know, we're not looking at L&M, operation maintenance, we're not looking, you know, it's, it's, we're trying, you know, it's a short term. We're trying to make it as simple as, as user friendly for you too as well. And you can, you can see we've taken out a fair number of the financial model requirements. And then lastly, as with any other uh, NDOT job, you've got to come up with your commitment from your, uh, your surety to, to provide the contract bonds. So we need a letter from those guys. You want Brian to, or Lane, you want to take this one? Yeah, I can discuss this and, okay. and have Brian describe the, and we'll take any questions regarding ECPCs. Um, so this is an illustrative uh, calendar of the processing of the monthly progress estimates and DCPC issuance that we put together just uh, something visually uh, to you, for you to refer to. So, as, and all of this is in the uh, financial provisions. So each month, uh, beginning, uh, well, with March, uh, about the 15th of the month, uh, the department will uh, prepare a progress estimate uh, for work performed and approved. And uh, we will, that will uh, be noted, the contract will be notified uh, shortly thereafter, of the amount earned. So approximately 15th, 16th, 17th time period, the contractor will be notified. Uh, others will be notified as well. FHWA, Nebraska Division will be notified, and uh, the controller division, my office, will be notified by construction division at that point as well. So uh, what the financial provisions then provide is uh, within uh, five days, and this is a change from uh, last month, within five days of being notified of the amount earned, the contractor will provide the department with draft DCPCs. So that's approximately, uh, as this calendar, illustrative calendar uh, includes, is about the 24th or 25th, so about five business days following notice. Um, so the, the contractor will include in the DCPC the certificate number, payment amount, uh, the due date, and the holder or payee. Uh, the department will then consult with the uh, contractor uh, to finalize. Uh, the DCPC will get the input and confirmation work. We'll coordinate with the uh, Federal Highway Administration to confirm the uh, eligible project costs pursuant to TIFIA. And uh, our objective is that, and as is included in the, uh, in the financial provisions, that on uh, the first of each month, the department will either make the cash payment subject to that $7.5 million quarterly maximum, or for anything, uh, once we've met the quarterly maximum, we will issue uh, DCPCs, uh, a final DCPC, uh, to the SPV, 
or SPVs established by the contractor so that they can then be taken to the lenders, including TIFIA. The objective is, is that uh, for TIFIA draws, that we'd have the uh, DCPC to you uh, no later than the first of each month um, so that you can then work with them uh, to have that draw by the 15th of each month. Uh, TIFIA's schedule for draws occur uh, on the um, first 15th and 25th of each month. Questions? Yeah, I guess we've got questions. Uh, just a comment on the DCPCs. I, I don't think we've received any specific questions on them, but if I have this right, it's Exhibit A to Section 5. Is the form of the Deferred Contract Payment Certificate, it's four pages. This is what we have um, hashed out with um, the Build America Bureau to accommodate a TIFIA lender, but obviously it needs to accommodate any lender or the contractor itself. Uh, we think it's in pretty good shape. And as Lynn described in the October meeting, you know, if you start with the date, uh, the amount to be paid, the due date, and information about the holder, whether that's the contractor or some entity that has purchased the certificate from the contractor. That's obviously key information, and I'm not going to go through all the boilerplate that has been pre negotiated here, but hit a few highlights. So the form itself is supposed to be good as gold, as Barman said. That's the plan. It's supposed to be self-sufficient. So, you know, the highlights, once you put that critical information on the front of the certificate, it says, for value received, the department hereby promises to pay the holder of this certificate. However, all payments, of course, are subject to appropriation by the legislature. It, it does include that covenant that during each budget cycle the department will um, seek an annual appropriation that is sufficient to cover all the payments due under the contract, including all of the DCPCs. Um, the department represents and warrants that the obligations here under are legal, valid, binding, and enforceable. Uh, it states that the amounts payable under the certificate will be free of any deduction or withholding for any future taxes, levies, imposts, etc., other offsets. It does state that the department uh, is entitled to prepay, as Barney described. And in the case of TIFIA, the payment amount will be discounted by the TIFIA rate. That is required that under the TIFIA program. The USDOT um, cannot accrue extra interest or charge a, a premium, so that face value gets discounted. But if it's not the TIFIA lender, then the department will pay the face value, and then it will pay any um, associated breakage costs with that. Um, and again, the, it does state that the department has seven business days um, in order to make a payment due before that becomes overdue, with um, presumably a penalty associated with that. And it affirms that the holder may assign or transfer the certificate to somebody else. So it could be the contractor. It could be the contractor's special purpose vehicle. If TIFIA is part of the financing solution, it could be some other entity um, if it's not a TIFIA financing solution. So that, those are the highlights of the certificate itself. If you have any concerns at all, large or small, please get those in. Again, we want that to be uh, workable both for USDOT and for other lenders. We've been spending several months working with uh, the Build America Bureau on developing the TIFIA term sheet, the DCPCs, um, and you can see there's a lot of language about TIFIA that has been, that's found its way into these special provisions. TIFIA could be a good solution for you, maybe it's not something you have an appetite for, but we've spent the time to come up to set the table for you if you're selected as the current loan to then go back, apply, and get your TIFIA loan. You know, money's cheap, and um, we, we've done our best to come up with commercial terms that should be uh, workable for you. I make this comment because we have not had a chance to talk to every one of your lenders or bankers or financial advisors or underwriters, or anybody else out there who you would have a relationship with or establish a relationship with that could come up with a fee.
feasible and low-cost solution to this financing. And I say that because, you know, we've had some questions about, well, will the department do this with our lender? Will the department do that with our lender? Will the department sign this agreement? Will the department agree to sign this? We put in as broad language as we feel comfortable with, acknowledging that the department <coughs> is really the credit behind the financing. And therefore, the department recognizes that it's going to need to work with you and your lender to, to get to financial close. Whether it's an opinion of the department council, uh, whether it's a certificate about the financing, uh, about the revenue sort, or whatever it is. We, we don't know exactly what that agreement's gonna look like, or those certificates are gonna look like, or the form of that opinion is going to look like. Believe me, the, the department's not here to hold you up and to hold the project up from getting the financial close. That's important to all of us, right? So we've tried to indicate to you that, um, and, you know, there's a definition of funding agreements, there's a definition of security talk, because we don't know what those are gonna be until you submit, you give us your financial submission, you're gonna list. To get to financial close, our lender's gonna need this from the department. Tell us what you're going to need and then we can evaluate that in terms of the feasibility of the financial solution. We can evaluate that in terms of its reasonableness as far as other types of those kind of deals that have been done with public agencies. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, as much as we would like to say, yeah, we'll sign a direct agreement with you, we can't say we're gonna sign a direct agreement with you because we don't know what that direct agreement's look like. Your direct agreement might be different than his. Your certificate might be different than theirs. Therefore, we've kept it as open and as reasonable as we can from the department's perspective as the things that the lender may want from the department to get to close. TIFIA, we know, believe me, we've been spending months with, with TIFIA to try and get that table set for you. But now you're going to go, and you may use TIFIA, you may use something else, you may use them together. We just don't know what that other thing is. And therefore, we can't just flat out say, oh yeah, we'll sign anything you give us. And I, I think that's an important point to make, to show that you know that there's a, there's a cooperation and a trust that goes on here, and uh, where the department is really not here to not get to close on, on the finance. We you know this is an important new tool for the department. We want to make a success of it, and therefore any you know not any but if you give us clear direction in your commitments from your lenders as to what they're going to need we can respond to that. But right now, we just don't know.